So, all right. Um, welcome, everybody. This is um, our final lecture of this series for this this uh, season. Um, we are we have our guests tonight are uh, from the Nevada Women's History Project. We have uh, Patty Bernard and Mona Reno from the Nevada Women's History Project. Um, they're going to be um, giving us a presentation tonight on uh, women and railroading. Um, it's called We Can Do It, Women Working on the Railroad. And we're gonna be talking about some uh, different examples of women who have worked on, who are, have ties to Nevada railroading, who are from Nevada and worked on railroads here in the state of Nevada. Um, so uh, for, so for, before we begin, um, I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions uh, by the way, my name is Adam Mahalski. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. I should probably begin with that. Um, if you have any questions during the, the presentation, you can type them into the chat box um, in front of you on the screen, and we will uh, we'll answer the questions um, at the end of our presentation. Um, and um, we'll, the, ne we'll, the next time we'll be um, Doing this series, we'll begin it again, uh, starting again next fall, uh, probably in September or October. And we'll be planning some different presentations over the summer so that we can have those available um, next year or well, next fall. So um, with that, um, Patty and Mona, are you ready to begin? We are. All right, take it away. Thank you for coming to our presentation. And um, this is us. And if here, if you want to get a hold of the Women's History Project at all, I'm hope I'm glad Adam is recording this because we always do citations and this uh, information. So you could uh, find us uh, in the future. We want to thank the Nevada State Railroad Museum for including us in their series. We'd also like to uh, thank Stephen Drew because he gave us some information and Dennis uh, Bigley, who also helped us. So women in the 19th century didn't have a lot of options about uh, working. Uh, they really were stuck into a mold. You could be a teacher or, or um, but once you got married, and had children, you really didn't get much work and done. There wasn't much uh, options for you. So these ladies that worked for the railroad in the late 1800s and early 1900s were really breaking the mold here. So they're very, they're very interesting, and uh, we hope you enjoy getting to know them. We're going to talk about these four ladies, and uh, they're in chronologic order by who worked for the railroads first. And uh, Kate Potwin, her she started as a telegraph operator in 1882. Maddie Kuhn was 1902. And then Mary Jones, she was, we didn't get her until 1920, quite a long time later. So that's the ladies we're gonna be talking about tonight. So Kate Potwin, um, I know we did put a lot of words on slides and that again is because we're thinking you might look at it again and, and stop and, and lead. And so this is just her vital statistics stuff. You know, she was born and she married for a very, very short time and then she died. And she, you'll notice that they were all in the very same place. She is a Contra Costa County girl in California. and um, they have a Kate Potwin collection at the Contra Costa Historical Society. And so uh, we'll be looking at one of the pictures that they have from there. She learned to be a telegrapher in 1882, just because after her divorce, she was looking for a job. And Martinez was very close to her. There, she knew a gentleman who was a tele telegrapher at Martinez and he said you know and this will sound familiar later on 
because that's the same way that Ma Kylie got going, is that someone said to her, you should be a telegrapher. And so she did. And her career, she had all kinds of jobs for a little while, and then, then she got stable. So she was a relief ticket agent uh, at the 16th Street Station in Oakland. And you don't just get a job at one place when you work for the railroad, you go from one station to the next wherever they need you. So she also worked in these other places that are all very close to Oakland. And here's her Nevada connection. In the early 1880s, she went to Humboldt House, uh, Humboldt in Pershing County as a night telegraph operator. And it left a serious impression on her for the rest of her life. <laughs> so um, uh, Dennis like gave us this hint on this wonderful book, The Southern Pacific Salt Lake Division. And uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce John Senior's name, but he uh, gave us permission to use photographs from his book in our presentation. So um, this is Humboldt House in its heyday. And Kate would have worked in, in that building. There's a fountain out front. Humboldt House was very interesting. They got water from a pipe that came down from the mountain and the pressure was so great. They had a fountain right out front uh, of the Humboldt House. So they had fresh water and good food the whole time. And this little ad, it just says, now, they had a reputation for having the best food on the railroad line. And uh, I saw this little guy in the middle of that ad and thought, oh, he's one of them things you flip over. So I uh, dined at the Humboldt house and he's happy and he didn't and he's sad. So those were very popular during that time period to have those flipper over art things. So here's where Humboldt House is. If you know um, I-80 and uh, Thunder Mountain, the, the art installation guy is right about here, you know, outside of Imlay, that Thunder Mountain. Um, it's a counterculture kind of art place, but some, a lot of people in Nevada know about it. So you'll have an idea where this is. And there's Rye Patch Reservoir. Now, it's still there. You can still see this line of trees. And there's a Nevada historic marker on I-80, or I'm going to turn off from it, that says what it is. And there's still green grass. And uh, people uh, live there. The great big building is gone. But um, uh, the location is, is still there. So here's what she said about it, because this is 1880 and there's absolutely nothing there. And she worked a 12 hour shift from noon to midnight. And all she ever saw was Indians and transients and their little fires and there was cracks in the window screens. And so she was very afraid. And um, so, cause she's a city girl, she's from Contra Costa County, you know, she's a city girl. And so she'd hear the coyotes howling. And so somebody suggested she get a dog and that she did and that helped. And then she told this story. This one is from a story she told uh, that was reprinted in 2004. She was long gone by then, but uh, Humboldt House left a real impression on her. And um, she went back to California. We don't know how long she stayed there, but she, that was enough Nevada um, because it had left such an, uh, an impact on her. So she registered to vote and obviously um, the Women's History Project was very involved in the 2020 hundredth anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And California got it in 1911 and Kate registered right away, 1912, she registered in Oakland and uh, she was a registered Republican for her whole life. So she went to work as a ticket agent. And I think that that's just what it sounds like, a person who 
sells tickets to to people and uh, she probably helped them board and that kind of thing. But um, the Carquinez Strait is at the very end of the Sacramento River where it hits um, San Pablo Bay on the way into San Francisco Bay. And the trains would stop at uh, Venetia. It's a little town on the north side of the strait. And they would have to load a boat and be ferried across the strait to continue their way south. And so that's where she worked uh, when she first got back. And then she moved back to that 16th Street station where she had been before she went to Nevada. And during that long career, you see that long career uh, there, she uh, went from smaller jobs to bigger jobs to bigger jobs. And she was the station agent. She ran the whole place, uh, all of these, the baggage people and the porters and the, there's some great stories about her being in her customer service, like um, a lady was frantic about her husband didn't have any socks. And she arranged to have a, a young man meet them in Sacramento and he would buy some socks and they could pay the young man in Sacramento and pick up the socks. Now, so she always said that customer service was the absolute uh, way to to do everything. So I that's quite an example from Oakland and pick up your socks in in Sacramento. So we found lots of pictures of Kate Copeland. She apparently was some sort of uh, cult figure. They were always interviewing her and um, that ferry that I was talking about for the for the train she was chosen to launch the very largest vessel made yet. And you can see it down there under her champagne bottle. It held, what did it say? It was 433 feet long and it would hold 36 freight cars and three engines. And it was just this massive thing that would go across and haul the trains until obviously later. Now there's a railroad bridge over that Carquina Strait. But she got to christen it. This guy named Charles Black uh, was a railroad employee, but he always wanted to be an illustrator. So he wrote this, he drew this cartoon. And there's the only woman in the picture is Kate and all these other people are that work there are men, but there's there's our lovely Kate. Some of her, this is her in her station in in Oakland. Now, when she started at the 16th Street station, it wasn't that big, beautiful building that's there now. It was just this uh, a much smaller place. So she was there during the construction of that. There's a new building there now. So I wouldn't have missed it for anything. That, and that's her attitude, excitement and thrills. Now I like this first one because she just can't figure out how any woman would take a little job and be happy with a little job because she was such a hard worker and so uh, motivated to go forward uh, on that first one. And the next one, um, is quite feminist for 1922. Because I don't know that uh, men everywhere are becoming reconciled to the fact that women are as equal in 1922, but she thought so. And so she was encouraging women to be active in their employment, not just go to work, but conduct yourself and make yourself so efficient uh, so you can play a better part in the business life. Here's the great big building I was talking about that was built while Kate was um, uh, in service there. And you can see this is her retirement photo of one of them. And she had worked there for 42 years.
And this is in that Cape Poland Contra Costa County Historical Society collection. That she lived on Broadway in Oakland for most of the end of her, her time there. And uh, there's her obituary. And she was 93 years old, or years young, really. <laughs> and uh, they were very proud of her having worked there for so long. It's like everybody in everywhere must have known her. Now we're going to go to the second lady, and um, Patty's going to tell us about Ma Kiley. Ma Kiley, Maddie Bright, Friesen Crew, Kylie Moss, Cropley Coon Moss. Um, she did have a few marriages. Her early life, she was born on March 1st, 1880, near Pleasanton, Texas, uh, to Charles and Alva Bright. That was not a happy marriage, and they were divorced when Maddie was seven years old. Uh, Maddie's mother, probably like most women, really couldn't survive with a family, so she gave her kids to her sister to take care of. And um, Charles didn't really like his in laws at all, nor his kids at the in laws, so he took them back but he was kind of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, he didn't really hold jobs. He was kind of an alcoholic. And uh, when Maddie was 11, Maddie's mother got them back to a man that she called, uh, Maddie called one of the finest men who ever drew a breath of life, Dan Franks. And Dan Franks was kind of a comer. Um, eventually he owned a, bought a hotel and turned it into a boarding house. And this is kind of a neat picture of the family, the blended family of the uh, Brights and the Franks. Now I want you to look at this picture because she looks full of life. Uh, she's looking out on her life. Uh, she's just happy. She goes to a concert in another town with a girlfriend. And in the band is a man who's much more older than she is. And he takes a liking to her and they spark for a couple weeks. He's 36, she's 16. And he goes to Dan Franks and says, I want to marry her. And this was the first man that had given her attention. So she was head over in love. And they married at... Um, on the 26th of uh, December, 1896. Now, what he didn't tell her was that he was a widower with three kids and um, they were living in Mexico, but it was kind of a Dr. Jekyll Hyde relationship. He was an abuser. He was old Italian or old German, old school. He decided that they didn't need a whole lot of food. So the kids, she actually talked him into bringing two of his kids to live with them. They didn't have food there. They didn't have clothing. And um, she decided that she just couldn't live with him. So she left Friesen after three years for drinking and non-support. She actually divorced him in 1904 at the suggestion of her stepson, Arthur Friesen, because the kids didn't like him either. Maddie learned to send Morse code in 1991. She went home. Um, her father, stepfather at that time had got this hotel, remodeled it and took in lodgers. And one of the lodgers worked for the railroad. So he taught her Morse code so she could send and her keyboarding skills were outstanding. Uh, a fellow by this, in her autobiography, she called him the superintendent of telegraph at New Orleans, um, heard her, he had come to visit somebody at the hotel and the dad said, well, you know, she's working with that Tom Fool machine. And uh, 
he said, well, she might be working at that Tom full machine, but she's very good at it. So she went in to talk to, he went in to talk to Maddie and Maddie said, well, I can send, but I don't know how to receive. So he arranged for her to go to a railroad station, a couple doors down from the train master's office and listen to that keyboarding that came in and went out. So now she was a keyboardist but she didn't get a first job as a keyboarder. Her stepfather, Mr. Franks, found her a job as an inspectoress at Customs, and this was her first paying job. Remember, she had a son, and she didn't have very much money, and obviously the family couldn't support her. The sister had married and had a decent, her husband had a decent job, and so Maddie was kind of a poor relative. Uh, she had a gun. She wandered around. The job was about, she liked that job, but it was abolished in 1902. So her first paying telegraphy job was in Sabinas, Mexico. Uh, she took Carl and her first train order was dated in August 22nd, 1902. Shortly after she got there, she got typhoid and had to quit and move back to Del Rio with her parents. But it was interesting because she brought Carl and she couldn't really, didn't know what to do with him when she was working. So she took him to work. Finally, the hotel manager said, why don't you leave Carl with me? I have a son and they can sleep together. But uh, Carl really had, as you will find, he was kind of an urchin because she really didn't have a stable job. So her second, second telegraphy job was in Durango, Mexico, and she worked nights. She could sleep most of the time and get healthier. And in March, 1903, she joined the Order of Railroad Telegraphers. And that was important for one reason. These folks didn't have a lot of money and that let them ride the railroads, most of the railroads free. So they went from job to job on the railroad. What I'd like you to look at is her face. You know, she was so full of, of joy and now she's kind of weather-worn. She's had a bit of real life and she looks hardened and she was hardened. Maddie married Alexander Crew on April 29th, 1904. Uh, she divorced Friesen in 1904, so she went from one to the next. He was husband number two. He was also a drunk and they got into a fight and she went into another room. They lived in a railroad car and John shot through the door where Maddie had gone. So she got Carl, she climbed out of the train car and hurried back to Del Rio to her parents. She was pregnant and to support herself, she did every kind of odd job. She made and sold embroidery to pay the doctor. Uh, Alva Gedney Crew was born December of 1905 and um, she, again, was, just took in anything she could to make a living. And when he was two, she got a two-week job on the railroad as a telegrapher. She paid um, um, for him to stay at uh, an orphanage for two weeks. That was her job. When she came back, he had a fever. Carl was fine, but Alva died. And she held that probably as she felt responsible for his death her whole life. Maddie divorced Crew around January 1908. Midlife, 1906 to 1935, Maddie went to work for the Rock Island Railroad. Now here she is just going from one job to another. She works then for Western Union. Well, Western Union telegraphers were on strike. Uh, she refused to send a telegraph. She got fired. 
John Kiley heard her kind of her snippy refusal to to work. And he said, who is that woman? She has spunk and I admire her for sticking up to her guns. I'm going to marry her if she'll have me. Well, she had him, which is probably a mistake. They were married June 23rd in Dallas, Texas. He was husband number three. He also drank. Maddie divorced him at the end of 08. That was a six month relationship. She divorced him in Lander County, Nevada, but she kept his name. And by this time, her skills are becoming known throughout the West. And that is probably about the time that she becomes Ma Kylie. And she keeps that name even though she has other names. She was living life as a boomer. Now we would call that an itinerant. But Dennis Bigley told me that in railroad vernacular, that is a boomer. And a boomer has a profession that travels from job to job. The job might be two weeks, might be four weeks, could be even a year. And that was really a long time. But um, she moved from job to job. Uh, she moved to one job to refuse to send a telegraph. She got fired. Uh, she got hired by the Milwaukee Railroad. Then she work ran out. She went to Oklahoma. And you'll see a map where she actually went, which is astounding for a single woman, um, mostly carrying a young boy around. She did send him to her parents every once in a while. She wound up in Oklahoma. She called to get Carl. She worked in Houston, but the heat was too much and she wanted to return to the Northwest. This is her application for the Northern Pacific Railroad Company. Uh, this is June of 1910. She's going by Maddie Colin Kylan. She's 30. She, she says she's a widow, but she's not, not at that point. She's got a son, Carl, who's 11, who's had an interesting life to, to um, be exact. Uh, she doesn't, um, she doesn't drink and she's never been employed as part of this system in the past, but she also has her nationality, which is not American, it's a Texan. And you'll find that out <laughs> later on why she's so proud as most Texans are. She winds up in Rosebud. And you can see it's kind of an out of the way place. There's Carl and Maddie with the two station folks. Um, a typical railroad station. Leaving Northern Pacific Railway, she goes to work at Miles City, Montana for the Western Union. And that's important because she didn't just work for railroads. She worked for Western Union. She worked for other businesses. And she had uh, a, another union card, which was very important to her. Um, she worked with another woman in Mile City. And as soon as she found out that that woman had been a scab during the Western Union strike that Maddie had got fired, she refused to work with the strike breaker and she just left employment. Next was the Oregon Short Line in Pocatello, Idaho. And again, she heard that we don't hire women, but because of her reputation and the great references and the long history of her, her railroad and telegraph life, she did get the job, but that we don't hire women was a common refrain. After that, she went back to Western Union in San Francisco. And from Western Union, she went to Gerlach in 1912, where she got appendicitis. The railroad tried to give her some health care, but it, they didn't spend a lot of money. And she finally ended up in St. Mary's Hospital in Reno. She had surgery at her own expense. After returning to Gerlach, she got sick again and went back to Del Rio, Texas to be cared for by her mom. But an interesting quote of what she thought of Texas. I've always been eye to eye with a guy who said that if he owned Texas and hell, he would rent Texas and live in hell. She left again in 1913. Now she's going north. She goes to the Canadian Pacific Railway in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. 
here again because she was a woman. She got transferred to a smaller location. She quit there when a man was promoted over her when she thought she was much better at the job and she undoubtedly was. She worked for the Canadian National Railway for a short time. And next she worked in Saskatchewan. Then she sold life insurance for the Great Western Life Insurance. And she then went to uh, Saskatchewan, broke her wrist, the order of railroad telegraphers paid her rent, ORT as they were known. Then next to Grand Trunk Pacific Railway to Prince Rupert Island, British Columbia. But she didn't report there for duty as she said it was the dangest looking dump she'd ever seen. Returning to California, she went to work for Belltel in Sacramento handling commercial telegraphs and then on to Coos Bay, Oregon to work for the Coos, Bay, Coos Curry Telephone Company, but they had a Western Union there, so it was a short-lived job. Now on to Austin for her next job for the Nevada Central Railroad, a narrow gauge between Battle Mountain and Austin. While in Lander County, she married William A. Moss, who was a native of Austin on June 23rd, 1915. She's always looking for the perfect man. She didn't find one in this one either. She divorced him in Inmalay in 1916. You can see uh, Inmalay Station. Uh, it actually was a pretty decent looking station. And Inmalay is uh, in between um, Elko, Winnemucca, and Wadsworth. Okay, on July 5th, 1916, Maddie was hired by the Southern Pacific Salt Lake Division in Sparks as a telegraph operator. It was the beginning of her stable employment. She brought Carl to Nevada in 1917. He was 19 and she brought him to Perrin, Nevada, which is slightly out of Fallon and is no longer in existence. Again, she finds somebody else. He's not a bad looking man. She marries and divorces Frank Copley. And the dates are conflicting. He's number five. The marriage license from California, Los Angeles official a license shows that she married him in 23. But all of the articles in Nevada say that she married him in 22. So we're not sure which one she really married him at, but she was separated for quite some time and she divorced him in Lovelock in 26. Now she meets Albert Kuhn, who could be the man of her dreams. He was born in 1870. She'd known him before in the early 1890s while she was living with her mom and stepdad Albert Kuhn was a boarder at the family hotel boarding house. He was a telegraph operator for the railroad. She met him again in 26 when he heard her voice repeating the train orders and he recognized her. They were both telegraph operators for the Southern Pacific. He was in California right over the border and she was in Nevada. They visited probably back and forth but they didn't marry until 31, and he was husband number six. They happily planned to eventually retire in Reno, but Albert died two years later in 1933 of a heart attack. Uh, she was absolutely surprised. So continuing on her work, now she's kind of winding down. She was in Ogden, Utah, and the Southern, of, uh, Pacific Railroad was probably recruiting women because of their ability at keyboarding. So it says the Southern Pacific has five women operators on its Salt Lake Division. And the Salt Lake Division, I believe, was from Salt Lake to Reno and possibly to California, but definitely to Reno. It says the clickety clack of the railroad telegraph key seems to have a fascination 
which is drawing an ever increasing number of women into the role of tele telegraphers. Railroaders agree that working a trick at the key is a job women can do well as men, and the pay on an hourly basis is the same for both. Well, that might be for the Southern Pacific Railroad, but it certainly wasn't for the rest of the railroads. In 1940, the census shows her that she's living in Sparks and she's done pretty well for having a fifth grade education. She was a widow. She had an income of 2,100 for the year and she owns her own home. And amazingly, Mona found the house that is still there. It probably didn't look like that but it was just a little brick house. Now in 1942, um, she's still working for the railroad, but she has an accident. And you'll notice that there is a machine or an apparatus there, and it's a train order hoop. For much of the 20th century, the, these poles were the most common and certainly the most essential tools in any train station. As it was impractical for every passing train to stop for messages, the poles were a simple way to pass on orders and return messages to the station. The hoop, as you notice, was curved. Um, it was bent uh, with a little bit of heat. And the orders were attached within the hoop and the pole was then held up to the passing train. The crewman on the passing train would stick his arm out and catch the hoop with his whole arm. And after pulling off the order, the message or whatever it was, it was tossed off the train and the station messenger or the telegraph operator would then trek along the track to recover the pole with an occasional return message. Well, he didn't do it well enough. He tossed it off and he hit Maddie in her head. And she did have some injury. She had vision problems also. So she looked at thinking about getting a retirement annuity. But that was challenging because she had worked for so many railroads, Western Union and the Postal, but only the railroad employment counted. So with her many marriages and name changes, she had a difficult time proving who she was and where she had worked. So she took a renewed annuity because she was unable to establish that she'd had 30 years of working for the railroads. But she said, I'm proud of my record. My service was first class, second to none. And certainly her reputation belied that. So here's the interesting thing. Here is a map of all of the places this worked, this woman worked as a boomer. It's amazing. You can see the reds were Western Union, the greens were the actual railroad, and the yellow was her life insurance. And so, and you can see she made it all the way up to British Columbia. Just amazing. Now in 1948, she owned her own house and she had quite a few friends in California. She might have even known Kate Potwin. I'll bet you she did. Um, she met an author who told her that her story, her life story was so interesting that she ought to write an autobiography. And so she did. She wrote it in 11 days. And she called it the bug and an eye. And the bug is an interesting contraption because it was um, a key machine for sending Morse code. And it was used by the telegraphers, vital for their job. And every telegrapher carried their own. So she wrote this very long autobiography, that was her very first try at writing. I'm sure he, the author helped her. And she sent it to the Railroad Magazine. And this is really interesting because Dennis Bagley got these Railroad Magazines um, probably in the 1960s. 
because he was quite interested in railroading and he's the one that really got us on to looking for the actual railroad editions because Dennis told us to get the book. But um, they liked it and they serialized it in four editions. Maddie remarried William Moss. Now, we know that because it was registered in Carson, but there is no other documentation on this marriage of a divorce. She went by the name Kuhn when she died and it's on her obituary. So it's on her death certificate, which we don't have. Now, um, in 1952, remember she kept her house in Sparks. She was driving and probably wasn't a very good driver, but she was not at fault. She got in an accident and um, there was an ambulance that was close by that had already come from the hospital on a return call. So she had some broken ribs. They took her to the hospital and she sued the man that hit her for $10,000. Uh, she went to court and she was awarded $5,000, which was a considerable sum for a woman in 1952. By 1956, she had a bit of dementia. She probably had quite a bit of dementia. She was still living in her Sparks house. She probably wasn't traveling. Um, she had vision problems to begin with. So we noticed that there was um, an action filed for guardianship of Maddie. Our assumption is that Carl, who was a bank officer in Reno, applied for the guardianship and he moved her out of Sparks to his house in Reno. Uh, she's now 76, uh, probably with a multitude of health problems. She died on July 30th, 1971. And uh, she got a pretty decent write-up uh, in this particular article. She's buried with Albert up in the Masonic uh, Gardens, uh, Memorial Gardens in uh, Reno. But interesting, you can see on each one, although it's not great, you can see the bug. They were so proud of that. And um, Albert was one also. So they both have that on their tombstone, rather unusual. Now, Carl Thompson Friesen, her son, with his upbringing, one would think that he would have been in jail, but he survived his upbringing and he becomes a solid citizen of Reno. He, from his job in Perrin, which um, in right outside of Fallon, he was there for six years and as a signal maintainer and or five years, and then he moved to Reno. He went to work for the bank and um, this is his registration Sorry. Um, as his signal, uh, been, um, go on. He went to work for the bank and he rose up through the ranks and he became vice president of the Keystone Reno Bank. He was in all of the local uh, businesses and uh, just a fine, upstanding citizen. He married Valera Stiff. And if anybody is familiar with Lovelock, there was a hotel called the Three Stiffs. It was the nicest hotel in Lovelock because Lovelock had a few problems by this time um, and didn't have a lot of, of first class hotels. So he marries Valera, and they are both also buried up at Mountain View. The importance of Maddie in my Ma Kiley's biography. 
Although she wasn't the first woman telegrapher, that was in the 1860s, she became the most famous. And her biography or autobiography is the most detailed one account of a woman telegrapher's career ever published. And the most important that could be documented and was documented. But Maddie's story is that of every woman who chose a non-traditional role of a working woman in the late 19, and early 20th centuries. There's many parallels between a woman who chooses to put her career first over everything else then and now. Her high technical and keyboarding skills can be paired compared to a woman computer programmer of today, as both require not only keyboard expertise, but also a knowledge of the mechanics of the machine processes. And as and women, women programmers today, Maddie was breaking ground on what mainly had been a male dominated profession. Carolyn Marvin in her book, When Old Technologies Were New, sums up the parallels between women telegraphy and women computing. In a historical sense, the computer is no more than an instantaneous telegraph with a prodigious memory and all the communications inventions in between have simply been elaborations on the telegraph's original work. And that is absolutely true. We're switching now to one of those traditional uh, women. This is like 1920, uh, Mary Jones is going to end up with the railroad, but she is uh, just a woman who, um, got married to Paul Jones when they were 23 and she stayed with him and they moved. They had children and they moved. They finally got to Nevada. They were in Mina in 1910 and the railroad people probably know what a wrap shop is, but uh, we don't. But so this is the woman who is just looking for work. Now we first heard of her because uh, Dr. Dana Bennett uh, sent us this clipping from the Elko uh, paper that says that she was the very first woman in Nevada to register to vote uh, at a special school board election, which was just fascinating. So when we started looking into who this was, we said, oh, look at that. She's a railroad laborer in 1920. Well, that doesn't tell us much because of that could be anything. So we really didn't know what Mary Jones did for the railroad. Um, we did find out that Mary's sister Sally's husband also worked for the railroad in Sparks, and that may be how they actually got to Sparks. So here's just a picture of the Sparks Roundhouse being built. Um, and the other Mary Jones, oh, this is our same Mary Jones. They came and went but back to Sparks to visit Sally and her family, even after they moved. By 1930, they were in Texas. So they didn't stay in Nevada very long either, but uh, it became kind of a, a place they went back to because of her sister. Now, uh, Mary died in 1957 in Mill Valley. Both of their daughters and their families were, were living there. But this Mary Jones, is listed as Mary M. Jones, and she's also in Imlay, but um, I got her for three months here. Ancestry has this railroad employment records, and usually these ladies just have initials. They don't have names. And you, you can see uh, the one in the very background is from the second half of July, uh, the 16th to the 31st. And the next two are the whole month of August in 1919. And she was a clerk for the foreman of the roundhouse. So we thought these were two different women, but the times and the names were so interesting. So we think they're probably the same woman because uh, Miss Mary Jones of Sparks office is going out to Imlay for uh, two months vacation to cover for a lady who's gone for two months. And then she goes back in September, she goes right back to Sparks. So this is the other kind of woman, the one who, the railroad is just a job for her. It's just, 
she's a happily married woman with children and she's just working in sparks for the railroad. Now, these women, you may know, uh, this is a modern example of a historic woman railroad crew, the engineers and the brakemen, and not just pushing paper. So we thought we'd share that with you. We have some uh, references. Well, no, it's at the end. Okay. So this is another one of them things, if you go back and watch it, and we always like to put in our citations for each of the people. And um, so you could always go back and look at those. So um, Patty has a, a conclusion for you. So the conclusion, as Mona said at the beginning of the program, the norm for employment choices for women were really limited. Uh, one of the three women we've highlighted in this present presentation provided a perfect example of limited female gender expectations, as well as the two who fought that caste system and became successful in their own right in spite of all of the barriers. Mary Jones chose a traditional job in an untraditional setting because of her husband. Her 1920 census classification denoted her as a railroad laborer, which covered all types of secretarial duties. Her time card indicated she was a mechanical clerk. Mary's daughter, Hester, on the other hand, was a 20 or 19 year old gal. She also worked at the same place, probably because of dad. But she married, so she was one of those examples that worked for a short time and married. Kate and Maddie, on the other hand, chose to learn technical, which were thought to be male-oriented skills, which allowed them to go much further in their non-traditional profession of that male resistance at every juncture. It seemed like both of these ladies sought some degree of social, uh, social uh, society normalcy as both tried marriage. Maddie had multiple marriages and divorces and Kate experienced one. These two found fame in their own way and on their own. Maddie summed up her life's value in her son. But there's no record written of what Kate, who had no children, thought of her life at the end. At the time of her retirement, she was quoted as reflecting on her career. I wouldn't have missed it for anything, full of interest, full of excitement, full of thrill. However, her Nevada obituary didn't even give her credit for being superintendent of one of Southern Pacific's more important train stations in the US, the 16th Street station in Oakland. It cleared more than 50 trains daily and she bossed a staff of 35. Instead, the obituary hailed her as a senior railroad woman and remarked that she had worked alone at an isolated Humboldt, Nevada as a night telegraph operator with an occasional Indian peering curiously through the window and that she had been a conductor once for a day. For Mary Jones, on the other hand, life and husband and was family were hers. Her notoriety came long after her death. As Mona said, she was discovered by a woman historian in 2020 as probably the first woman to register to vote in Nevada. As women historians come into the profession and researchers and writers, they are finding what thought to be an absence of women's history was just there waiting to be discovered. Maddie's autobiography, although discovered and compiled by a male author in 1998, is a perfect example of information out there to be found. The telephone brought an end to the need of telegraphers and little research has been done on those women's lives. One reason is history up to recent times has been a male dominated sphere. But the other is that understanding the mechanizations related to putting code into words is hard to understand. So writers found it more difficult to write about what one didn't understand. And such few women telegraphers left any information about their lives. There were other women out there easier to find and to write about. 
that Maddie's four, mag four magazine articles done in 1950 were compiled into a book in 1998 is one of only a few autobiographies of women telegraphers and only the one that can be documented. All three of these ladies show information on women's lives in the early 20th century. We're finding many of these women do leave personal reminiscences. They just need to be uncovered. And that is one of the facets of what the Nevada Women's History Project does. We thank you for viewing this presentation. Our mission is to provide visibility and support for the gathering and dissemination of the history and roles of contributions of all Nevadans. We do have a great website if you are unfamiliar with it. In fact, we have three. We have one that is our main site that carries our biographies and et cetera. We have a suffrage site and we have a new legacy site for those of you both male and female um, that want to put pictures and perhaps um, a, an obituary up. We want to capture the regular Nevadans, not the ones that are in the history books. So anybody can go to our legacy website and uh, for a small fee that pays for the technician to load them, uh, load a picture and we hope an obituary gives wonderful history of that person's role in Nevada. So please join us. We need your help with women's history. And whether your skills are researching or writing or helping us with programs, we need you all. Thank you very much. You're muted, Adam. <laughs> Yeah, I have difficulties with these technology, this technology sometimes. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. That was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm just kind of impressed with um, like people like uh, Ma or like women like Ma Kylie. Like um, I can, having um, lived in Texas, I can, I feel like I could relate <laughs> to her. <laughs> And some of her thoughts on Texas. I'm sorry if there's any Texans here on the call, um, but um, but she just seems like a, a fascinating woman, and yeah. Um, and yeah, like and she was a boomer and lived all over the West and worked in, I mean, three different countries and you know had a variety of jobs and so it, I mean it's just really cool to see. Um, I, I mean, she just seems like she was a strong woman. Like all of them were like very strong women and. Um, and I think that's really interesting to see, especially from that time period, because we don't get to always hear those stories about um, women like that from that time period. Um, uh, whether, um, so I'm just trying to, uh, we got some, looks like we have some questions. Um, let's see. Um, Crystal had a question, uh, was, Kate Potwin, well known due to her excellent customer service. Yes, that and her longevity. You know, she ran that station for 35 years mm -hmm. or worked at that station and ran it. So, yeah, and her customer service, that was only one story. Um, there were several in the paper. There was another one about delivering pharmaceuticals to somebody who was traveling and needed their medication. I mean, she just went over and above. And it, it seemed like if someone in her station needed something, they were just sent to her and she would make it happen. So yeah, customer service was everything. And, but she was there for such a long time. I, and Oakland was so little at the time, you know, when she started there in 1893 is when she started there. So I imagine everybody that went in and out of there knew her. Yeah. You know, and, and talking about both women, and strong women. Both women were above average in height. Um, Kate um, was quite tall. And we know that Maddie, they said, I believe was 5'8". So virtue of kind of a chip on their shoulder anyway, they're in a man's world. Yeah. And Maddie had no problem telling folks off. 
as you would know from a Texan. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, and, and just even like by her story, I mean, when you see that she was married five or six times, it seems like she's, I'm not going to put up with. Right. You know. So the, for, the force of both women's personalities really propelled them on to higher than a normal woman at that period in time. They were quite forceful with yeah. men and women. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it, it just, it was, yeah, I just find that facet. Yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting. It, it, it seemed too like most of these women had some connection to either the Humboldt House or Imlay. And I'm yeah. kind of wondering how, I mean, is that just by, you know, uh, uh, coincidence or was there just something uh, special? It, it, was be, it was because the, the railroad line ran through that area and both wound up working there at various times yes uh Imlay, Humboldt, uh, Wadsworth all of those railroad stations along the line women just as as uh, Mona said you just were sent out there or you were sent to Ogden Utah um it was just part of the job um and then Crystal was interested in the illustrations um like what was the source for the illustrations for mm -hmm. maddie yes um the originals from the railroad magazine um the they're all from those four parts and uh in the first one where we introduced um the uh maddie to that uh, we credited Emmett Watson, the illustrator, for that. Uh, he, he drew all those specifically for that magazine. And um, there are many more. <laughs> and and they're, they're really great. And um, so, yeah, his name is Emmett Watson. And he was an illustrator for the Railroad Magazine at 1915 when she did this. So he did those to just augment her autobiography. Okay. They're great, aren't they? I liked it ah. because she aged too. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one when she's leaving with the baby, you know, she's really young. And by the end when, and she's throwing a Basco out of a, out of a telegraph station, <laughs> you know? yeah. she's getting older. She's 56 by then. And, and so, um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then Crystal was wondering about um, about Maddie and uh, the vision issues she had. She she was wondering, did the vision issues for for Maddie come from the hoop? Because the what like, the ones that we have are fairly light, yeah, made of bamboo. Mm -hmm. But but I'm kind yeah. of wondering if maybe like I'm wondering if it was made of a different material because uh, we ours are made of bamboo. Um, but, so th I mean, this was, they said it, it was bamboo. The, it was bamboo. Uh -huh. okay. And it hit her in the ear too. She had oh. hearing problems also, which would make it pretty hard to, to be, to take telegraphs. But yeah, they told her, I mean, by then she worked from 1902 to 1942. So she had 40 years. And they just said, well, you should just retire. And she had 40 years of a hard life. Hard <laughs> yeah, seems like she it. was yeah. ridden hard and put away wet. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and it, even when you, and you look to it, um, you know, how she was having trouble uh, with, the, with her work, with the, like putting everything in order so that she could get her disability pay. Yeah. I mean, I just thought that was interesting because like, I, I feel like that's a problem that, maybe a woman would have because she's had to change her name so many times from getting mm. married. And I don't know if men would have that same no. issue no. so much because they having to change their names so often from getting married. You know, and, and what I would like to add is um, earlier on when we talked about the traditional woman mm -hmm. uh, that just held on to that job until, until the, you know, they were got married. The problem with that was that the man usually died before the woman oh. and the woman was left with kids and possibly a house and she had no skills. 
And uh, up until the 1940s, half of the estate went directly to the man and only half of the estate could go to the woman. So that man could take it and give it to whoever he wanted. Yeah. And so she was left with a pittance and a lot of them were just uh, as, as Maddie's early life. They were one meal a day if they got a, one meal. A lot of them, friends helped them out. Now, the railroad union then later on helped with the man. If, they, if he died, then they did get a, a uh, small pittance. And as you know, she worked for the railroad, so I don't know whether she got both or not. Yeah. And it, yeah, and it would make sense. I kind of wondered if she got Albert, because on the 1940 census, it said she had income from other sources. And I wondered if she had Albert's railroad. Also. Uh, sure, yeah. Also. We it's never different. found anything about that, of course, because yeah. that's personnel records. But Yeah, and that, and that could be, yeah, that definitely could be a possibility, too. Mm -hmm. She was the beneficiary. Um, but the, the sad thing about Maddie is she might have found the perfect man. Yeah. You know, at the end, she might have found him. Yeah. But it's, you know, circumstances happen. Right. Yeah. And yeah, because it seemed like she had a lot of bad luck with men up until that point. <laughs> and then found somebody she liked, and then he died shortly thereafter. Well, there's um, another story about her, the early in her, in her life when, um, uh, uh, a, a man asked her uh, if she was Irish, and she said, no, I'm Scotch, Irish, and American. And he said, I knew you were too blank, blank mean to be just Irish. <laughs> so I think, you know, she had a, she had an attitude. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I liked how she had written her nationality as Texan. And like, <laughs> when I, was, I, when I lived in San Antonio, and I... And, like for four years and um but i did i i felt like texans were definitely proud to be texan it's like <laughs> well you know I, they were they were a republic <laughs> yeah right and yeah. um I, and i've heard the story that when texans go abroad that you know like if i were to go abroad i'd say i'm from the united states but they would they generally will say uh, i'm from texas as opposed <laughs> to the united states so very proud uh very proud mm -hmm. of their state for sure mm -hmm. um and then we have a comment from joyce uh joyce cox it says i have a photo of women working on freight uh, working on the freight platform at the sparks southern pacific railroad in oh wow works book uh there are women in wadsworth working for sprr that were awarded lots in the railroad reserve paying one dollar for the lot. Uh, oh. Sally Finley paid one dollar for lot 12 of block two in the reserve. Uh, nice. She had sold that lot in 1904. So, um, Well, you know, and they moved um, Wadsworth into the Sparks. Wadsworth came first. And so, you know, it's to Helen gone kind of from Reno when you think about it, and they wanted people to, to live there. Right, right, exactly. Um, and then Crystal is mentioning too that Wendell, Wendell, the curator of history here at the museum, Wendell Huffman, has a great story of a station agent, uh, a female station agent who burnt down a station because her husband was, who worked there was seeing another woman at the station. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, and now that I'm, and uh, yeah, Crystal's jogging my memory of this. I don't remember the exact story, but I think this happened on the Central Pacific in California. Um, yeah, but I don't really, I don't remember the whole story, but it is a good story. But yeah, there was a, a station agent there, a female <laughs> station agent, and she was mad um, that her husband was seeing another woman, so she burned down the station. <laughs> Um, I'll have to see if Wendell can provide us some more information. She must have been a Texan. Huh? Yeah, she might have been. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions uh, for Patty and Mona? Uh, I do want to make a correction because I, 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 Dennis worked for me. Uh, I was a principal and, and he was a teacher. But I keep mispronouncing his name, but it's Beagley, not Bigley. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Patty, tell them about um, Dennis meeting Carl at the bank. Oh, that's a, that's an interesting story. So <laughs> Stephen uh, led me to this lady that is writing the history of women. And evidently she are women railroad people. And evidently she's been writing it for some time. And so when I emailed her, you know, she said, uh, I don't want to share anything because it's taken me so long to compile these histories that when my book comes out, I've shared enough. I'm not going to share with you. And I understand that. So then I called Dennis because Dennis worked for the railroad. And then when SB um, sometime in the 90s, 80s, I guess, um, was sold or joined, Dennis then retired from the railroad and went into education. So we're good. And he gives me a lot of my, my um, information for history. He's a real collector. So he said, my mom knows a fellow who was a bank president. He said, I can't think of his name, but he said that his mother was a famous telegrapher. And so we sat and he said, I got to stop and think about this. So the next day he called me or emailed me back and said, I know who it is. It's Ma Kylie. And there is a book. Uh, so we went on the internet together and I ordered the book. And that's how we started with Ma Kylie. We did not know of her. And the fact that she actually died in Reno, she was a resident and her son rose to such prominence. It's just a wonderful story. You're muted again, Adam. Yes, I just realized that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Crystal, Crystal was wondering where you could order that book. Oh, online. You, you have uh, it or... And it was not that hard to get. Okay. Uh, let me give you the author. Okay. Oh, yeah, let's see. Actually, this man did two books. The other one I love. Oops, that doesn't work, does it? No. Jepson. Let me nope, just read that doesn't work. So it's Ma Kylie, The Life of a, Rail a Railroad Telegrapher by Thomas C. Jepson. It's by Southwestern Studios, number 104. What's the other one? And he wrote another one, Sisters. Oh, gosh, I can't. Stephen, oh, I'll I... bet you Stephen Drew can bring that one up. I got it in the citation. Um, sisters. Going... See, that's why we put citations at the end of our talk. So we can look at them. And I love that one also. Um, sit my sister's telegraphic women in the telegraph office, 1846 to 1950, Ohio Press, Ohio University Press. Okay. Uh, it's 2000 and uh, Ma Kylie was 1998. But uh, I didn't know that much about uh, telegraphers and how it the telephone really put them out of business. Um, we had Western Telegraph until the 60s. So it took a long time to die. But um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful subject. And we're over an hour right now. Mona gives me a note. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just posted a, a link to the um, for a book for the the Ma Kylie book. Oh, great. Um, I oh, would, great! I just found it on Amazon, but um, the the price is two hundred fifty dollars. So I don't think that. Uh, oh, there's got to be a cheaper there, price here. Yeah, I didn't find. I didn't pay that. <laughs> But that way, but at least people can kind of take a look at it. I, I have a link there for that one so that people can get an idea of the name. And the, the other one, her Bug and I, uh, I have them all scanned. I bought those four volumes and I, and they're all uh, not copyrighted anymore. 
Okay. We could, it's all defunct. And uh, anyone that would like me to send that to them as a PDF could contact the Women's History Project at uh, nevwhp at gmail.com and I would send them that PDF. So that's nevwhp at gmail.com? Yes. And I could send them that PDF of all four of those. Mm -hmm. And that's where those terrific drawings are. All right. And, um, Stephen and Crystal, Moody. I'll just send you one. <laughs> right. Perfect. And uh, Stephen Drew says, thank you for sharing your research with us. Keep up the good work. Uh, kindest regards, Stephen Drew, Sacramento. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, yeah, and also again, it also when it coming to this too, when it comes to railroading uh, here at the museum, we're always looking for volunteers and uh, to help operate our trains and stuff. And we, um, if you, so, if anybody's out there that's interested in being on our train crews or just working at the museum in general, um, we're always happy to to have. Like we've we've gotten a, a few, last year we had our. Um, uh, the supper special which you which you participated in as well and we had an all-female crew for that uh which was really uh an amazing outstanding amazing time and yeah we had a great fun with that um it was it just um one of my friends that participated in it uh carolyn falou uh i mean she had mentioned that she felt empowered <laughs> <laughs> by being able to be on the train because she, she had no interest in it to begin with and she was just doing it as a favor to me because I'm one of her friends and then when she got into it she's like oh wow this is actually really cool <laughs> so well, good good but, yeah so uh anybody on this uh if anybody's interested and we I know we have some of our volunteers that are on the crew so um yeah they all have a really good time with it and, and enjoy themselves so mm -hmm. Well, thank you because we really enjoyed doing this. Yeah, and thank you for uh, thank you for giving this presentation tonight. We really appreciate it. I thought it was very interesting and informative, and um, just very entertaining. So, thank mm -hmm. you very much, Patty and Mona. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. And with that, we'll uh, end the presentation. So, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and we'll see you next season. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye, Bye. <laughs>